Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to the Nautel webinar on getting content to and from the transmitter site. This is a record-breaking webinar for us. I don't think we've ever had as many registries as this particular one has attracted. And the reason, I think, is quite obvious, quite simple. We have a rock star dream team panel of experts to talk to you on this subject. I'm joined by Chris Crump, the Director of Sales and Marketing for Combrex, who's hanging out in an airport. Hi, Chris. Hey, everybody. Um, well, welcome to San Antonio. Welcome aboard, Chris. Um, I'm joined also by Jeff Holdenred, the Sales Manager of Double Radius. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how are we doing today? Good. Where are you joining us from? Charlotte, North Carolina. Excellent. We've got Alex Hartman with us, speaking for the whole industry of broadcast engineers. He's the owner and partner of Optimize Media Group. Hello, Alex. Hello. And where are you speaking to us from today? Uh, snowy St. Cloud, Minnesota. It's supposed to be snowy up there. Great. Mr. Bill Gold is also with us, broadcast sales manager of Mosley. And Bill has been uh, without power and internet for the last couple of days due to a nor'easter. Hi, Bill. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, from Haverhill, Massachusetts. <laughs> Glad you're here. Glad you could make it. Hope the uh, hope the power stays on. And all the way from the Netherlands, Hans van Zupfen of Thimio Audio Technology. Welcome, Hans. Yeah, thank you. Hi. We're glad to have you here. So today, what we're going to do, without further ado, we're going to talk about four different basic technologies for getting audio to and from the transmitter site. Microwave IP, digital UHF transmission, hardware codecs, and composite codecs. And the three key criteria we'd like to examine these technologies with is the cost, both the initial and the ongoing cost. The reliability, both in terms of outages, either long-term or short-term, and the possibility of hacking, which is a, a very uh, topical uh, subject at the moment. But we're going to talk about audio performance, and we're going to talk about the suitability for SFN. And that's basically whether or not the propagation time of the, of the link uh, is, is stable and, and uh, can be uh, synced potentially to GPS. And we're going to take your questions. So you'll notice on the GoToWebinar application that uh, there's a place to click and, and, and ask a question. And when you enter in a question in there, uh, you can do it any time during the webinar. And we will answer all the questions at the end, or as many as we can get to. Uh, remember that the completion of a Nautel webinar qualifies for a half of an SBE recertification credit, which is identified under Category 1 of the recertification schedule for SBE certifications. And I would ask our panelists, make sure you're, you're muted when you're not, when you're not online. Uh, so not too many years ago, certainly within my career, you really didn't have a lot of choices to get the audio back and forth from your studio to your transmitter site. You had copper and with equalization, if you're lucky, remember the old 111 coils, uh, mono or stereo VHF or UHF STLs, uh, discrete or composite, but always analog. Uh, there was DSL and, and the above were often the weak link, the Achilles heel in a station air change, both from the reliability and from the audio performance standpoint. Today, however, there are many excellent choices. And so what we're gonna to try to do today is to examine them. And we're gonna start with digital STLs. Uh, Bill? Thanks, Chuck, and hello everybody again. Um, I wanna to talk today about digital STLs. Uh, just thinking when Chuck was talking about the about the night the, uh, the local, uh, one of our local yokels decided to burn his store down and it burnt down the cable on the way up to the transmitter and of course we're off the air forever and it's nice to have things under our own control these days um, as for digital STLs one thing I want to say that really covers the whole the whole uh, scope of digital STLs as opposed to the analog predecessors is a digital STL can deliver you a bit identical copy of the input to the output and that means no noise no noise buildup, no noise, no distortion that you will get in any analog circuit. Um, the cost is the cost is moderate. It's not cheap. Um, all in, you're probably looking at twelve to fifteen thousand 
plus the uh, plus the antennas. But a digital STL will last you 25 years and it has no recurring expense. It's all yours. Um, the reliability is great. Uh, you have a licensed channel, so there's no, no interlopers. Um, you're using point-to-point -point antennas. So there's really not much to hack. Um, a lot of system accessories are available, repeaters, redundant systems, hot standbys. Um, so it, it's, it's really a well-built out and, and uh, seasoned, seasoned technology. As far as single frequency networks, uh, a digital STL on 950 will work great, actually. Um, there's negligible delay through the system. Uh, there's no jitter. So, uh, so timing stays in sync, and and you can you can work it from there. Um, with a digital STL, there's lots of opportunities. Um, multiple channels, you can get up to four stations with uh, in a 950 megahertz channel. Uh, using modern compression, um, you can carry the HD radio stream. You can carry RDS, or you can carry several uh, uh, micro MPX. Uh, which will be talked about later on in, in this program. Um, however, STL, by definition, studio to transmitter, it's only one way. So there's no data possibilities for networking. Hence, we move on to the next slide and talk about the add-on data radios for, for the 900. Actually, they run at 900, um, but they will share the 950 megahertz antennas. Um, there's no license, so there's easy, they're easy to deploy. They're moderate costs, less than five grand. Um, they're pretty secure, actually. Um, you'd actually need to, an identical unit know, and to know the spread code, which every one is, every system's different, um, if you've paid attention to the manual. And there's two levels of password protection, so it's, it's pretty secure. Um, with that, you can extend your network out to the transmitter site, um, affect transmitter control, put a computer there for email and internet. Uh, you can look up a manual at midnight without driving back to the station, things like that that really, uh, really make your life a little bit easier um, and save money in, in the long run. Uh, you can even put a cheap webcam on it and keep an eye on your transmitter or the front door. Um, the uh, the only real the only real limitation to it is the fact that it's it's a megabit in in the case of ours anyway it's a megabit throughput but you can get an awful lot done with uh, with a megabit. Moving on to digital composite, something that's coming back on the scene um, again, differentiated from analog composite. It's digitally sampled um, composite. Um, these are, some people really like composites. You could put your, your processing at the studio, you can inject your SCA, so on and so forth. Um, the cost is moderate, a little less than, little less than a, a, a 950 uh, a full digital STL. Um, but uh, um, the, uh, most of the same uh, advantages of the 950 Hold true here, um, and, and they work good for single frequency networks. Um, you can actually use common processing and then split the MPX so that you have an identical audio stream going to each transmitter or booster, which makes it uh, much, much easier to, uh, to synchronize. Um, performance specs of this blow away the old analog stuff um, in terms of separation, noise, and uh, distortion. And uh, they're uh, okay. pretty new on pretty new on the scene. Yep. Um, moving on to T1, yes, they're still around. Uh, cost is moderate, less than RF, but you've got the returning t recurring T1 cost. Reliability is great; they just work forever. Um, but they're susceptible to network failure uh, or back post fade. Carry pretty much the same payload as a 950 but they're inherently bi-directional, so all your Ethernet networking possibilities are available to you. Um, any IP applications that you can run over a network 
are available to you there. They'll work great for SFN um, applications. Uh, they have low, low and very predictable latency and uh, and no jitter. Very good. And because they're not on the public internet, they're not very hackable. Not really. Um, yeah. That's great. You can't get into a T1. Um, and these are the uh, the new possibilities in in STL microwave STL six eleven eighteen. 23 and 26 gigahertz very high bi-directional bandwidth over 100 megabits uh, the backbone of the radios that, that we have are, are 155 megabit backbone so it's, it's pretty pretty heavy duty radio um, these frequencies are licensed um, so there's no interlopers um, the cost of the system is fairly high um, all in you're looking at probably about 25k um, however, there are some good things, um, and it's worth it. Um, you can carry multiple stations if you have combined studios and, and transmitter sites. Um, you can get a whole lot of audio in 100 megabits. Um, AES-192 over IP fits just fine multiple times. Um, any audio over IP studio applications that uh, require like a node, you can put the node at the transmitter site and stay in your native uh, audio format. And uh, of course you can have a network with off-premises mirrored servers, uh, uh, you can run video, you can run, you know, anything you want that'll fit in a 100 megabits of bits of bandwidth. Reliability's good, however some of the bands have rain fade um, mm -hmm. as you get into the upper frequencies, something you have to watch out for like 23 uh, 23 gig. You'd, those are very short paths that you'd want to run them on. Yep. Um, they'd work great for single frequencies. A um, little bit of a maybe overkill for uh, for that type of application, but there's there's no latency or jitter, and the timing stays consistent through the system. Um, while these are costly, the payload justifies the system cost in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, really, a choice is determined by your station's requirements. Um, as to which which way you want to go on a on an STL, um, I welcome anybody to call me and and chat about it, and, and I do free path profiles. Thank so, you, Bill. And, and from the security and hacking standpoint, I suspect it's the narrow beam width of the receive antennas that makes them relatively free from hacking. That that's correct, and and uh, at least with the with the uh, with the 950 systems, and to some degree with these as well, they're not really carrying anything that anybody would be interested in I mean they can listen to your audio if I guess if they could decode it but yeah there's you know it's all it's all proprietary uh, transmission too so yeah. you know you can't okay really get to it. thank you thank you Bill and Chris Crump just in just in time welcome and would you like to walk through this sure why not um, okay hopefully my audio is okay you sound good buddy um, Excellent. Um, my uh, internet setup is a little scurrilous here because I'm actually in the lobby of, a, of an airport, but please bear with me. Okay. So um, when we first introduced our Access IP audio codec in 2005, um, our engineering department just about had a stroke when someone called up and said, you know, I've been running this thing for a week and it stopped. And we were like, what are you using it for? He said, we're using it for an STL over, um, over a... Uh, uh, satellite. In this case, it was a VSAT satellite. And we're like, you know, this is designed for a remote codec for doing broadcast remotes, not an STL. And he said, yeah, but I have a choice. I can either use your product or I can go dark. Wow. So our engineers really kind of stepped it up and they basically ripped the whole thing down and redesigned it. So it would be a broadcast reliable, uh, full duty cycle, 24 7, 365 appliance. And the result was a device capable of being either a backup or a primary STL. And one of the things that we always tell people when they use it in an STL application is to you know, make sure that you always have the best possible circuit you can afford um, and use a wired uh, dedicated uh, circuit if possible. Right. And um, I guess that would include BSAT if that's the only thing you've got out in East Texas. Um, and there are plenty of people that are using VSAT as an STL. 
By the way, uh, somebody left their car at the loading dock. I hear that, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, some other things you can do is make sure you always ask your service provider for a service level agreement because you want them to be able to put their money where their mouth is. When, you, when you're paying for a good circuit, you want to make sure that that circuit has an uptime um, that's going to be guaranteed better than four nines if possible. And that still means like 10 minutes a month. But um, a service level agreement is kind of your ability to tell the, the provider to put their money where their mouth is. Um, network redundancy is always important. And you should always research the secret sauce of any of the IP audio codecs that you're going to use. Um, you know, build solutions are great, but um, not always cost effective in all applications. Um, if you're only billing $300 a day, then maybe an IP audio codec will fit the bill. Um, but there are things that you can do to make an IP audio codec a little bit more reliable. And how do I advance a slide? Because I, 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 I missed the training. Oh, perfect. Um, so everybody that has an IP audio codec, especially in the higher dollar range, um, is going to have some kind of dynamic buffer management. They're all going to have high quality uh, coding algorithms to make sure that the audio is 20 hertz to 22 kilohertz, better than broadcast quality. All have some kind of error concealment protection techniques, things like FEC um, and so forth. They all have the ability to deal with network address translators um, on routers and some kind of SIP-based interoperability. And that's one of the things that makes, um, makes it easy for different codec manufacturers to speak to one another. So I can speak to a ZIP or to a um, user cam or I can talk to a tie line or another device. And of course, some level of redundancy is always going to be important. Yep. We go to We've got to keep this one moving along, Chris. We've got a short time, so we'll keep going. Okay, so I'll tell you about the Comrex secret sauce, and I'm going to talk very fast since my time is short. Um, we developed something called um, Brick Technology, which is broadcast reliable internet codec technology. Brute is an offshoot of that, basically to make, um, and it sounds like an oxymoron, to make UDP more reliable. Um, and basically, there are two modes. There's a UDP reliability mode that will basically retransmit packets to make sure that they get through in the event that they get lost on a network, and then a congestion avoidance mode that has the ability to throttle the encoder. And we're going to skip past uh, the, the profile section, if you would be so kind. I did. So let's talk. OK, thank you very much. So let's talk a little bit about security. One of the very first things you're going to see when you turn on a, a Comrex Access or a BrickLink is an AG screen that asks you to change the default profile. Because the last thing we're going to want is a forecast uh, on, our, on our station. Um, because the FCC doesn't like that, and a lot of times our listeners don't. So um, it's always a good idea to make sure that um, you try to make it as safe as possible by making it kind of a hard-to-guess password. Um, you can always secure the web interface. All these things are, are listed on there. Use the connection password functionality so that only your codec can connect to your codec so somebody can't hack into it. One of the things that we've learned is that if you change the SIP port, if you use the SIP functionality of your device, instead of using the standard 5060 um, UDP, change it to 5061 or 5062. There are a lot of SIP bots that are out there, and a lot of times there are auto dialers from other parts of the world that are basically going to log on to your device and lock it up. We saw that happen just last week with a customer uh, where they were getting garbled audio because uh, one of these SIP bots had dialed in and basically hung up the system and they couldn't get rid of it until they rebooted the system. You can also also use a, a VPN on both sides of your codec, whether it's IPsec 53 or some kind of AES counter mode encryption. Uh, our current version of firmware actually has the ability to do AES counter mode encryption on your device and also some intrusion protection. Uh, flash exploits is another thing that we've heard about. Even though our devices are flash based, you can actually use a non-flash application like our Kodak Commander or Fleet Commander software uh, and basically um, not even use the flash interface at all. Okay, so we've developed something called Crosslock. It was actually developed for our video product and we ported it back over to our audio codecs. And basically it's a whole new level of protection for your codecs. It does all of the things that you want, would want it to do to make sure that your data gets through 
and it has an adaptive management engine that actually has the ability to monitor multiple data networks. So you could have multiple wired connections on each end. It'll monitor each, figure out how much data you can send across each one, and then apply the appropriate error correction protection techniques on each one. So again, everybody has the secret sauce in theirs. They do it a little bit differently, but it's really important if you want to have a broadcast reliable transmission for STL pads. Look. Yep. Could I, could I get you to hit the magic button, please? I did. Oh, really? Oh, look at that. I'm not even paying attention. Sorry about that. Um, so a couple of cross lock modes that we offer are bonding that actually bonds all those data channels together and also a redundancy mode, which will basically send the same data down both ones. Um, basically, you just have to choose which one you want based on the application that you're using. Great. And next, please. So it's available in our Access, uh, uh, Access and BrickLink firmware version 4.0 uh, for two USB rack mount and the BrickLink codex. I will say that um, IP is IP. It doesn't matter if it's public internet um, or a something like Jeff Holden is gonna talk about the um, uh, ISM band radios and the 2.4 and 5.8 gig band uh, or even uh, bass band radios as well. Um, Basically making sure that your transmission is reliable as possible on the codec end is what we care about. Um, and I'll leave it up to the other guys to tell you how to make that transmission link, that IP transmission link as reliable as possible. Okay. So thank you very much, Chris and Jeff. Uh, yes, if you could go back one slide, we already jumped forward. There we oh, go, thank you. All right, the advantages of an IP STL. Um, Real quick, everything's bi-directional when you get into an IP world, and all we're doing is extending your layer two network or your existing LAN to your transmitter site. Um, layer two traffic, it doesn't really matter what it carries across it. We can do audio for radio, we can do video for TV, we can do video security, voice over IP, re remote control data, it doesn't really care. So if you wanna put a camera or voice over IP system out at your transmitter site, we can carry that along with your audio. Um, next slide, please. So wh where do you start? There's so many options, uh, unlicensed, licensed, uh, piggyback systems. Uh, the unlicensed systems, you get a high throughput. Uh, today we're seeing you know, unlicensed systems carry multiple 100, 100 megabits of throughput. Latencies are usually between five to 10 milliseconds, but the one thing you have to be careful about is interference. Uh, because you don't own the frequency, anybody can use it. A lot of people say, my transmitter site's in the middle of nowhere. Well, one thing to know is there's 7,000 wireless internet service providers in the country that are bringing internet access to houses of underserved areas, and they're using these 5.8 bands, these 2.4 bands, the 900 megahertz band to do this. So interference is actually where it's least likely uh, and not so much where it's you know right next to you. Um, so tread lightly with that, but for a few hundred dollars, you can put up a pretty nice unlicensed system. Uh, licensed systems, this is FCC part 101 and some of your part 74 if you're looking in the TV band. Um, but on the part 101, like Bill said, it's 6, 11, 18, 23. Uh, I'm not so familiar with the 26 like he is, but the 6 and 11 are the primary uses for long shots. These are high full duplex throughput. So if you have 100 megs going out, you have 100 megs coming back. You got a gig going out, you got a gig coming back. And the latency is, is less than a millisecond. Usually we see 100 microseconds. And you own the frequency. So you're licensing this for 10 years. And with that, you own the license. You can't control somebody illegally putting a channel up, but you own that frequency for that a bit of time. Uh, we also offer a piggyback, which is a lot like, uh, you know, a 950 underbuild or a 902 to 928 radio piggybacking on your 950. These are also bi-directional. They carry, uh, we've seen throughputs between five and 20 megs max on this system, uh, but your latency is gonna be higher, roughly about a 40 millisecond uh, latency on those. But they can still carry, you know, your audio, your remote control, and a couple other things at the same time. Deployment options, this is a key thing to pay attention to. Uh, we're not a manufacturer, so we rep a lot of different products, and this is one of the things you have to take into consideration with your deployments. An all outdoor system is where the radio is mounted directly to the antenna or is integrated to the antenna, and all your ports, your ethernet, your fiber, uh, your TDM ports, they're all on the tower, and you have to run those connections down. 
Ethernet is the first thing to spike on a surge. Uh, it's the first thing to pop. It's not very resilient. So I always tread lightly with these. Try to use fiber DC connections um, if you can. Um, but that is your lowest cost of ownership for a deployment. Um, the all indoor would be the, the flip of that. Everything is located inside your doghouse or inside your studio. And uh, you run your elliptical waveguide up the tower uh, directly to the antenna. It is the most reliable. You don't have to tower climb for a, an equipment failure. Obviously, if you have a problem with your line, uh, that, that's a different story. But your, your hardware being indoors makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot and fix. Uh, now, the split system is the one that I prefer uh, in, in, you know, basically you're running your I internet T1s, uh, ASI fiber connections are all located inside. You run a half inch or Heliax cable up the tower uh, to the, to the uh, RF unit, which is mounted directly to the antenna. Um, th this kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Uh, your, like I said, your Ethernet that's going to pop first is on the ground, so it's less likely to hit that, uh, to get that spike from a, a static discharge or a surge protection. Uh, and it's also the middle road cost of ownership. <clears throat> so just real quick, these are just some basic diagrams of what an, an all outdoor system looks like. Basically cat five up the tower with the grounding and everything else. Uh, if you're running a system like this, a lot of times I get a call, it's not working, it's not working. The radio is working fine. Most of the time with FM broadcast, uh, the FM is interfering with the ethernet cable because ethernet uh, transmits data at 100 megahertz. So you put that next to a radio station just you know 99.7 with 25,000 watts all of a sudden you're interfering with the ethernet cable and the radio is still working fine the data is just not getting to it so be careful with that you can run a fiber and dc system uh, fiber just make sure you protect it because it can easily be uh, you know destroyed on the tower jeff i i do need to uh, uh enter in here and say that if jeff welton was on the call you'd have to uh You'd have to add the toroids to the to the feed yeah. line coming down the tower. <laughs> yeah, that's um, th those are things that can be added to this to help out with that. Um, this is just a standard diagram for a deployment, whether it's for FM or even for commercial or anything else. I hear you. <laughs> so the all indoor, uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory. The IRFU and the network connections are all in the rack. Uh, this will usually take up four to five U. Uh, we run everything into your dehydrator, uh, and you run your elliptical waveguide up the tower, which those are usually higher powered radios uh, to try and make up for some of the loss. But the longer your cable run, obviously the the loss is going to be greater going up the tower, which is going to bring down the the output power of your your system and and possibly uh, not hit that that reliability status that you guys are looking for, but this is the the most reliable system when it comes to troubleshooting and fixing. Split system, um, same thing. You got the RF unit which is attached to the antenna. Uh, we use a half inch, so a lot of people like LMR 400 or LMR 600. Uh, other people, I recommend an LDF 4 or an FSJ 4, uh, just because uh, it's got a longer life cycle on the tower. But all your network connections are are inside inside your rack um, and and away from the elements. Typical indoor unit setup, uh, this has got your IP ports, your SFP ports, your, your power supply, uh, the N-type female connection, which runs up the tower to the antenna and your grounding lug. Um, the SFP ports can be used for expansion. For this particular system here, we can expand to T1s if you're using, uh, you know, still using TDM technology, or we can even put ASIs on there and do native ASI if you're a TV radio split or if you just need to do uh, ASI across the system. Uh, then this is just showing some frequency diversity. Um, we have the ability to to put two RF units on a single antenna, uh, and this can be as a one plus one, or we can use both polarities and run a two plus O scenario uh, to double throughput or just to keep things flowing at the same time. Antennas very rarely fail. Obviously, they get destroyed by ice and things like that, but uh, the antenna itself rarely fails. So we like to do this a lot of times. It doesn't add add wind load, extra wind load to your towers. Uh, you're just, you are still running double cables, but the antenna is pretty much so, it's just the one antenna then. And in this, you can see the expansion port went to the, TD, uh, to the, to the T1 ports as an expansion for this particular system. Uh, bottom line is do your path calc. Um, do it on your own. Call everybody you know to do it. Call Bill to have, uh, you know, Mosley do it. Uh, just double check your work. Have them do it from scratch. 
people in the southeast, uh, you basically, you know, you have humidity and rain fade that's a lot greater than like Arizona. So uh, you need to double check. There is no certain math or two miles is this frequency, this antenna. Uh, so do your double work. Um, I also do path calcs and engineering for free. So if worse comes to worse, call me. Let's compare apples to apples and let's make sure this is the system that works for you. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it very much. A lot of good content today. I'm learning a lot. And now we have Hans von Zupen from the Netherlands at Thimio Technology. Hans? Hi. Um, yeah, so in uh, recent years, uh, FM clippers have improved a lot and uh, using composite clipping where you make use of knowledge about uh, what your pilot and RDS look like, uh, we can basically put uh, up to 140% of left-right audio into 100% modulation. So this gives you two or three dBs more highs and a lot clearer, more open and dynamic sound. Um, now, if you would go to your transmitter with left-right audio, you lose all that and you would need a clipper at the transmitter side to do the same thing. And then you suddenly need more equipment. It gets more difficult, more expensive. Um, what you can see here in the images, the left image shows uh, traditional uh, clipping and the right image shows composite clipping. In both cases, we're looking at the demodulated left channel. So it's quite obvious that the right image uh, will give you much more loudness and much more dynamics and clarity. Well, clarity you can see, but there's more headroom, so basically less clipping for the same loudness level. Uh, beside those things, because we know what the MPX, the full MPX signal looks like, we can optimize it for better reception and actually make the RF bandwidth smaller, so you get less multipath issues and better fringe reception. Um, yeah, so... Um, Okay, so we want to go to the transmitter with the full uh, uh, MPX signal. Uh, so you might think, okay, let's just do some analog connection. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, the quality of your reception, or actually the quality of the signal that you broadcast, has a big effect on the reception quality. Uh, you might think, well, FM is noisy anyway, so nobody's going to notice a bit of extra noise from an analog uh, transmitter in between, or an analog link in between. Um, what we noticed is that we, we got feedback from several people who were using our own processor, stereo tool, and replaced uh, an older analog box or an, or an older uh, processor by stereo tool, and then suddenly reported, hey, our stereo reception area is increased by, in some cases, up to 20 miles. So we were actually completely baffled by it and didn't get it until we figured out that um, Modern car radios are using all kinds of tricks to determine how good the reception quality is and blend to mono if they decide that it's bad. Noise adds up, so more noise around the pilot, for example, but also above the RDS and also in the quadrature signal, will cause all kinds of, uh, yeah, will cause those chips to think that reception is worse and they will just blend to mono much easier, much sooner, uh, which causes you to lose a lot of stereo reception. And of course, that's also the case if you use an analog STL. Uh, okay. Next slide, yep. Yeah. So uh, then we want to go to the transmitter with an with a with a digital signal. Now, if you don't use any tricks at all, then you would need at least about 120. So let's use 128 kilohertz and 16-bit audio, and then you end up using two megabits of data. Um, on top of that, you have to add error correction data, network overhead. So it will actually be slightly more than that. Um, if you don't have enough data available, you can lower it a bit and then lose some bits, but then you get a higher noise floor. So instead, we made micro MPX. And what micro MPX does, it basically gives the same effect as a full composite link does, but at 320 kilobit. Uh, still, you have to add error correction and network overhead. But you get all the uh, all the benefits of composite, so the RDS is included, pilot is included, peak control is perfect, and you still have those left-right channel peaks up to 140%. And since it's a low bitrate connection, it's just an IP stream, you can send it over any IP connection that you have, including satellites. You can send multiple streams over a single 900, 950 megahertz connection, and well, that's basically the advantages here. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I can imagine that people now are thinking, hey, but 320 kilobit, that has to be lossy. Well, that's true, but it doesn't have traditional lossy compression artifacts. We actually designed micro MPX specifically for FM, and it's not using an existing codec. It's the first codec ever made, especially for FM. 
So it does not have the holes in the spectrum that you would get with traditional codecs. It does not have pre and post ringing. And all of those things are things that um, will not be masked in any way on FM because, well, you would basically get the worst of two worlds. You get the codec artifacts plus noise from a FM. Uh, so this thing instead will only add white noise, but it still has more than 100 dB pilot protection. The RDS signal is perfectly clean. And we've compared it uh, a long time ago already, and the codec has been improved a lot since. And even back then, uh, the level of the artifacts was more than 6 dB lower than that of MP3 at the same bit rate. And keep in mind that is with the full signal, with pilot, with RDS, and with perfect peak control, all things that you don't have with MP3. Uh, yeah, so um, features for security and redundancy. Uh, we have forward error correction, already mentioned before by uh, other speakers today. Uh, what we also have is redundant links via multiple connections. So for example, if you have a satellite link and a fiber link, or a satellite link and just a normal ISP, you can send the same signal through both connections. And as long as every packet arrives somehow via at least one of the two connections, the signal will be perfectly there and the reception, and reception will be perfect. Uh, we support unicast and multicast. And for security and hacking protection, we are adding stream password protection in the next version. And we're also working on single frequency uh, network support for, yeah, so for time alignment and uh, even lower bit rates than 320 which would especially be useful for satellite, uh, for example. Sure. Um, pricing. Um, well, each decoder and encoder separately in software only is $395. That's list price. If you buy it with Omnia SST, you get a discount, and the total price will be $1395 for SST, which is a full FM processor with MicroMPX included and one decoder. Um, the Omnia 9 is getting it in the next update. The Omnia 7 is planned, and we're also looking at hardware encoders and decoders and building it into transmitters. Pretty and uh, if you make your own hardware, um, I should probably mention that it can be pretty, a decoder at least can be pretty cheap, an encoder as well, by the way. We have one station that has actually been running it uh, for the last 16 months on air on a Raspberry Pi 3 with a sound card that together cost less than $100. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Hans. Okay, so we've heard from the industry experts in the manufacturing side of things. Now let's go down into the trenches and uh, get the perspective of Alex Hartman. Alex? Hello. Uh, so, yeah, the, as you've already heard from all the guys who make the stuff, now we, it's our job to put it all together and make it. So we have some expectations coming down from on high at the management level, and then there's reality. So our expectations, it must work at all times, 7.9 reliability, must not introduce any coding artifacts that the listener can interpret as a problem with the station, because you will hear about it from everybody, uh, must be able to be serviced uh, and have redundancy, and of course, security is paramount. The reality of that is, pick three of them. Traditional STLs that are out there, uh, you know, Bill touched on them, the, the T1s and the, and the 950 links that are available. Yeah, everybody remembers this nightmare, don't we? Uh, T1, E1, ISDN, telco lines. Uh, the phone guys aren't there anymore. They've all retired and moved on. It can take weeks to get a T1 repaired today. It's just absolutely flabbergasting that a simple, reliable connection has just gone to this level. Uh, the 950, you have total control, but unfortunately, just like as mentioned, you have no return path. So it's a one-way thing, and, it, and proprietary coding keeps the security pretty high. In the new world order, however, IP is the world, so we have total control over these links. Uh, you know, in, inexpensive generally, uh, in bi-directional and IP-based. So what does that mean? You can shove anything that you can plug an Ethernet cable into. Uh, audio, control, phone lines. Uh, my favorite is remote file storage, emergency backup stuff. Uh, studio to studio links, if you've got remote studios. Uh, I've got a couple of stations that do that. Basically anything IP just works. Uh, the cons, obviously, unlicensed options can have random interference from household Wi-Fi or other point-to-point -point links from uh, wireless internet providers. License op options can be uh, cost prohibitive for the smaller mom and pops that are out there. Uh, and it does require a little bit of IT and knowledge, uh, more than just setting up a Windows computer uh, to understand how this all works. So which one is right for you? Uh, you know, there's hardware solutions. Uh, are you an uh, AOIP plant, an uh, Axia I port, or a Wheatstone Edge plate to slow it down to go over these links? Uh, more traditional, uh, you know, analog house, Comrex, Tyline, Worldcast, uh, Mosley makes all these products. 
that uh, have been out there and are traditional. Uh, you know, they come with minimal configuration. Uh, they're standalone. You have tons of factory support. Uh, work perfectly with the network and SFN uh, applications, and they all pretty much have do have the uh, redundancy built in. The cons of those, uh, you know, they are uh, interoperability is a problem from time to time, as was mentioned by uh, Mr. Crump there. Uh, getting a tie line to talk to a Comrex, for instance, can be a challenge. Uh, can be expensive depending on how you implement it. Uh, firmware updates may not address specific issues such as timing concerns over SFNs and security concerns require factory intervention. Uh, protocols get broken into all the time and then they've got to spend the next six months updating their firmware to patch that hole. Uh, then you have the software based guys. You've got the, you know, the micro MPX, the open OB, G streamer, Livewire, Wheatnet, Shoutcast, Icecast, so on and so forth. Uh, those things are, you know, they're very inexpensive to do. Software can be, you know, is very inexpensive or even free. Uh, there's usually a user community, so you get a lot of help in that respect. Uh, runs on commodity PC hardware. It can be, you know, use something out of the junk pile. For like uh, Hans mentioned, he has a station running it on a Raspberry Pi 3 that costs less than 100 bucks to build. Uh, redundancies can be built in, uh, N plus one. Uh, CDN or cloud virtualization options. You can run your entire radio station out of the cloud for redundancy. Uh, and obviously, network and SFN applications are available for that as well. The cons of that, they can be extremely complex to set up and, and implement. You are the support for that. Uh, and that leads to the next point. Support can be non-existent or even abandonware. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's out there, uh, you know, the guy who made it doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Um, security and buffers, yeah, buffering issues can render the entire thing useless at a drop of a hat as well. So go into, into it with a grain of salt. So which one really is right for you? The answer is whatever you, your comfort level is, then you know the best. Security, otherwise known as the problem with all of them. They all have their own flaws. Uh, best practices of using public internet or other non-direct links, such as a T1 or a microwave link, uh, is to use VPN appliance uh, and ensure the link is obfuscated from the public world. Uh, believe me, VPNs are not difficult to set up today. The hardware has these little wizards. You just click the button and it does it. Uh, VPNs add latency uh, and overhead, however, due to the hardware encryption, uh, can add an X factor for uh, HD and uh, network delay settings you have to maintain. Change the default password even if you use a VPN. A VPN obfuscates your link. It does not protect you from the program director bringing in an infected laptop. So don't use default passwords anywhere, uh, even if you have a VPN. And then more security concerns that are out there. Everybody knows who I'm sure has paid attention to uh, Jeff Welton's uh, slide on that. Uh, Shodan knows about you and your equipment. Broadcasters have become the low-hanging fruit because we trust intrinsically all these devices. Uh, default passwords, public IPs from either poking holes in firewalls or foolishly static IP addresses it leaves you wide open for these guys to come in and play in your house. Uh, you know, hackers can take over your station, you know, setting off EAS machines. Change hardware settings, lock you out of your own hardware so you have to reset it. Or even worse, uh, ask any accountant who doesn't want their checkbook seen. It can give you a very, very bad day. So uh, there's a new world for order that comes along, and this is the final frontier, RF hacking. It's a real thing. There's a lot of guys out there that are doing it. Uh, common SDRs that are available for under a couple hundred dollars, and uh, even one that you can use the RTL SDR that's 10 bucks on Amazon. Uh, that'll let you in and sniff the air nearby, even miles away, if you know what you're doing with a directional antenna uh, to decode passwords. WPA was just recently determined to be insecure due to a protocol flaw. It's broken, so everybody gets new Wi-Fi devices. Uh, Ubiquity does use a different modulation scheme to obfuscate from those types of devices called AirMax. A uh, little bit different, but uh, not impossible to break into. So what have we realized in the reality of it? Guess what? Mom was right. The world's a dangerous place. No, nothing's perfect. Nobody has it completely right at all. Uh, they're getting closer, but hackers will always, always, always have a bigger hammer than what you do in yours. If they don't, they will make one. Seven nines is worth enough uptime. You'll ne never see it again. That Those days are gone. Uh, the guys who know what ISDN and T1 is, they've all retired. They don't want to do it anymore. Neither does the phone company. The phone company doesn't even want to be a phone company. Uh, here in Minnesota, for instance, the PUC has allowed CenturyLink to not be a phone company. They can abandon the copper plant uh, as early as uh, 2019. So no more tariffs. And they love that because your price goes up and their margins go up. 
uh, backups only work if you test them regularly. Unplug things. Pull the Ethernet cable and see what happens and how fast it re, uh, reacts. Uh, test those, uh, you know, re redundancy connections. Unplug both of them. Plug them both back in. What happens? You need to be provided. <laughs> uh, you need to be prepared, rather, for the uh, for the uh, for the eventuality that things will fail. Um, and IPSTLs can do a lot more than the traditional systems can of yesteryear, and this is the way of the world. But you know. One, two, three, four, five, still a bad password for your luggage and your transmitter. So go change those right now. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, Alex, that's that's awesome. I'm I'm sitting here thinking how much I've learned. Anyway, let's let's go to our questions. I don't know if we'll have time to answer them all, but we do have quite a few here. So let me uh, see what I can do here. Um, what is the delay through a 950 megahertz digital STL? Does it change depending on any modes of use? I think that's uh, to you, Bill. Hello, Bill. Still with us? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. What's the, what's the delay go. through a 950 megahertz digital STL, please? It's uh, typically it's it's almost unmeasurable um, through a 950. It's it's a little bit, uh, it's, but it's in the it's in the one or two millisecond uh, range. That's a lot for an SFN, though. The typical accuracy that we need in order to have the signal synchronized within the, the mush zone, if you will, is in the mm -hmm. neighborhood of one microsecond. So, yeah, you know, it is important to know what that what that propagation time is. Yeah, but it's constant. Okay, that's it good. And change. There's no does jitter. it change? If you unplug it and plug it back in, does the, is the propagation time still the same? Yes. Okay, excellent. Very good. Uh, Alex asks, with the SHF microwave links, what is the average beam width of an antenna? I guess it depends on the size of it, but what's the range? My goodness. I don't, <laughs> beam width? I, I don't know. I'd have to look at a at an antenna. Uh, Jeff, have you got any kind of idea? A, which, which frequency? or The SHF I mean, stuff. Very high. I mean, if, if, if you're size. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at your 611, 18, 23, your two to six foot dish, uh, you're looking at like 1.2 to, I think it's 2.8 degrees of beam width. Great. Okay. That's a, that's a guesstimation. Okay. Very good. That's, that's useful though. Uh, are there issues like rain fade with the Mosley gear? Is there a max distance between hops or concerns? I, I think you pretty much answered that. Depends on frequency. Definitely depends on frequency. Uh, there's, there's little or no possibility of rain fade at 950. Um, six, uh, if we're talking about the gigahertz range, six and 11 are pretty, uh, pretty bulletproof. Um, 18, eh, you got to watch the length of the path, but I've got some, I've got some out there that are running just fine. No errors during blizzards. Um, 23 we hear that that's not so good. And I got very little experience with 26. Okay. Um, there's a person asking when this webinar will be available. We hope in the next couple of hours you'll be able to find it on our website if you want to watch it again. Uh, how do you set up an auto changeover for an IP-based system, or can you do this going through two different paths? Chris, maybe that's one for you, buddy. Possibly repeat that. Okay. How do you set up an auto switchover for an IP-based system, or, or can you do this going through two different paths? Well, our device doesn't have an auto switch over. Basically, the adaptive management engine in um, Access or Bricklink is capable of deciding what's happening with the network. It can use both. Uh, okay. It can use all. Um, and it basically is an intelligent management engine that's deciding if one of those networks is not usable, it'll basically load balance it all over to the other one. Uh, so there's really no setup if you're using ours. There are other systems that are out there, like uh, Mushroom Networks and some other um, IP link failover systems that, again, are kind of automatic based on parameters you set for, for traffic and um, uh, errors and so forth based on percentage. Um, but for us, we try to make it as easy as possible for customers. Sounds good. Alex, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, if you're a, a much larger uh, broadcaster or, you know, a, a, like a India type of thing where you control, you know, a very large geographic area where you probably have a very large fat internet pipe, as we call them, uh, from a government agency. You can get things like BGP and OSPF to handle your failover uh, to self-heal the network. 
so it, as far as switching the audio goes and in, in, in ways of doing that, uh, you know, a standard silence sense is one way to do it. Um, you know, the, the traditional methods is really still the, the standard practice. There's, no one has come up with this magic bullet that will automatically switch your audio path for you over an IP system. Right. Okay. Except for the fact, of course, that the Nautel transmitters do support multiple audio inputs. And so any of your systems can be a main and a backup and the Nautel will sense silence and switch it automatically. Right. Yeah. One last question. And to keep it fair, this one should probably go to Hans. So uh, what is the, the, the secret to getting composite signal out of a sound card, Hans? Hello, Hans. Ah, now I'm mute. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. okay. Hi. Uh, what's the secret? Well, uh, as I said, we made our own codec. So um, yeah, the question is, the question is on the sound card, though. Uh, you know, oh, the sound a card. Ah. Put it, the sound card. Uh, well, there's actually no secret there. You can just use a sound card that's capable of sending out audio up to 192 kilohertz. Yeah. And then uh, the composite signal goes up to 60 kilohertz. So anything going above 128 or something or 120 officially, but 128, let's say that. So basically the 192 sound card will be able to handle it. And in fact, you can even use the digital output of a sound card and just go into the transmitter with a digital link if it supports that. Okay. But well, it's, just, it's, it's basically just data, So, uh, yeah. but, but up to 60 kilohertz. So as, the, the other important thing is to have a sound card that has a very flat frequency response. We yeah. have a list of those. Yeah, if you've got that, maybe we could post it uh, on the webinar. If you could give us that list, uh, Hans, that'd be useful. Okay. Well, very good. We have uh, many places you can keep in touch with Nautel through our Waves newsletter, through our webinars, uh, through YouTube. You can find the, the copies of not only uh, recordings of not only this webinar within a couple of hours, but also the hundred or so that we still have from, uh, from the past. Uh, up there, and you, these are all very useful and, and inf interesting information. I, I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers. I, I'm, I'm really um, uh, in awe of the knowledge around this table, uh, the rock star panel, a dream team, if you will. Here's the email addresses for all my friends here. I want to thank each of you um, uh, for being a part of this. We, we uh, said we were going to try to stick this in 45 minutes. We didn't quite make it, but all in all, I think there was a lot of good information. We didn't get to all the questions. We will answer them all, however via email following the uh, the webinar. So for uh, for the dream team of Bill Gould, Chris Crump, Jeff Hollenred, Hans von Suppen, and Alex Hartman, I'm Chuck Kelly thanking you so much for being with us today and have a good one. Bye-bye.